Apple possibly poised to make the biggest deal in its history and in the process create what could be hip hop's first billionaire. My first billionaire in hip hop right here from the motherfucking West Coast. Believe me. Oh, oh, shit. <laughs> When it comes to recording studios, there are a few as legendary as Record One. Known to cater to elite clientele like Michael Jackson and Dr. Dre, this studio is built like no other. In today's video, we'll be exploring the insane story of how this facility went from being Michael Jackson's wonderland to Dr. Dre's hit-making mecca. It's the 1980s and Bruce Wadeen just finished mixing Quincy Jones's Back on the Block. With Record One on extended lockout, Bruce was armed and dangerous to begin recording and mixing a new series of Michael Jackson albums. Michael had a pretty great deal with CBS. I think at 18 million up front for each record, non recoupable But on Dangerous, we actually exceeded that number. With the funds in place, Bruce would go on to mix these albums in Record One Studio B, using the studio's custom Neve 8078 console. The result would be tens of millions of records sold and an unprecedented run of Grammys for Best Engineered Album. And when it came time to record Michael's next album, History, you know Bruce had to up the ante. The mere 112 inputs of the Neve console would no longer be enough. Therefore, it was exiled to East West Studios. And this half was from record one. Uh... With new ambitions and an even fatter budget in place, Bruce Wadeen and studio owner Alan Sides would go about designing the ultimate studio. The centerpiece of record one Studio A was a custom SSL G+ with over 200 mix channels, which was the largest mix console ever built at the time. And to complement the largest mix console, Alan Size decided to install three massive Oceanway HR1 speakers, which were capable of producing levels of 118 dB without any harshness or distortion. We had a system called the HR1, which is what Michael Jackson and Dr. Dre were using. And each speaker is nine feet high and seven feet wide. And with booming budgets and minimal limitations, things got crazy while Michael was in the studio. We had so much fun during the Michael Jackson era. You know, we have, we have two chefs. We have the microbiotic chef and soul food chef. So you could have ribs in one hand and organic in the other. <laughs> wow. So he's your... <laughs> wow, that is cool. <laughs> it was great. And then it was like a candy store. We had a whole candy store set up. It was like going into a movie theater. And you walked in, it was all set up. And the Michael's office was crazy. He had like all these toys and dolls, all this crazy stuff. And then you walk in one day and Harry Kissinger there, or Catherine Hepburn's there, or Steven Spielberg's there, or every day was just crazy. But suddenly, things would change when one particular super producer would take notice to the studio. The next thing you know, toys and trinkets made way for NPCs and phantoms. As producer Dr. Dre would take over the studio. You know, with speakers like the HR1, Dre was obsessed. The result would be another incredible string of hits produced, mixed, and recorded out of that studio. Yeah, when Michael finally finished up, then Dre came in and took over record one for an extended period. And we did, you know, in the club and all that stuff together. Yeah. and. Uh, you know, just a bunch of records for Dre. Great that, records. Great records. And that was a, and Dre's a great guy. And and, uh, and that was a very good time, too. And while Dre was there, he made a few modifications to the studio. He actually expanded the HR1 by adding even more subwoofers. And the world's largest SSLG console made way for the new SSLJ. In fact, Dre loved it much more than his SSLG due to its expanded bandwidth and some of the extra punch it had. Walk out the door, you see someone that you know and they ask you how you are and you just have to say that you're fine. And the old G would be shipped off to Eminem. After having the studio in extended lockout for a number of years, Dre wanted to finally purchase the facility and make it his home. But him and Alan Sides weren't able to come to terms until this happened. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. There's a reason why when top producers and mixers like Dr. Dre find a perfect studio, they won't let go of it. Having a great sounding studio with proper acoustic control and treatment is essential to getting a great product. Unfortunately, most people's studio setups are terrible and hinder their result. But I've set out to change this. I've teamed up with Grammy nominated master engineer and acoustics expert Gerhard Westphalen to bring you the acoustics course. This course will show you the start to finish process on how to properly design, optimize, and treat your dream studio. You'll learn how to build super cost-effective treatment, how to measure your own room to identify problems, how to tune and optimize the position of your speakers, and so much more. For a limited time, if you click the link in the description below, we'll be giving away free absorber build plans, studio design checklist, and a listening position setup guide. If you wanna check out the course, go to www.georgetmusic.com or head to the description. Anyways, back to the video. While initially Dre was unable to afford record one, things would change when he made a legendary deal with Apple, making him one of hip hop's first billionaires. The selling price? Rumored to be a whopping $3.2 billion. They need to update the Forbes list. He also recorded his legendary celebration video in the lobby of record one. 
Well, he celebrated, he celebrated his, his billionaire status on TMZ in the living room at record one. With Dre now having the funds secured, the deal went through. What happened is he really wanted to buy record one, but that was before he was a billionaire, right? And he didn't want to pay what I wanted, but then he became a billionaire and things were easier to negotiate terms. <laughs> <laughs> and once that check hit, you know Dre went crazy pimping out the studio. He would completely redesign and upgrade the entire facility again. The most noticeable thing about his new facility is his brand new speakers that he put in Studio A. Instead of Oceanway, these speakers were custom designed by designer Bill Jenkins. They contained two sets of four 15-inch speakers and 14 18-inch subwoofers. And we in the biggest, I'm talking about the, this the, this the biggest, when I tell you this the biggest, if this ain't the biggest Tony special in the world. The system would do more than enough to satisfy Dre's needs of regularly playing music, volume levels of 110 to 115 dB. I was showing the speakers in the back. Hey man, it's been oh wow. I I, I got invited to uh I got invited to Dr. Dre studio today, and it was on my bucket list. I never met the guy. I met him, and we got some work done. And he heard rapper go to the league. And okay. And of course, with Dre's newfound fortune, he would quickly replace the SSL J consoles to get the brand new SSL K. He would even redo the facility's B room to bring it up to the same spec, and completely redo the kitchen and lounge areas of the studio, making it quite the luxurious spot. Hopefully y'all enjoyed that look into the history of the amazing Record One studio. Getting a glimpse of elite studios like this is rare, so if y'all did like the video, please don't forget to like and subscribe, it really helps me out. Anyways, I'll see y'all in the next video.